Hi friends, where are we today? We're at the Bayshore Center at Bivalve. We're in their lovely museum. And this is our friend, Terry Watson. Hello. Terry, what is your position here? My title is Director of Donor and Volunteer Relations. Okay, wonderful. And can you tell us a little bit about what started this museum and who was interested in it and what, why were they interested in preserving the history of this area? Many years ago, uh, Megan Wren was then a young girl, I was 23, and she had a vision of a floating classroom. So um, the mirror world was found in the mud, and she, I think she acquired the mirror world for like a dollar, and wow. she started the restoration project. She got a board of directors together, she got a herd of volunteers, and uh, a lot of people just worked really hard. A lot of people in the community as volunteers did a lot of work to restore the mirror world. And her dream was realized because now the mirror world is a floating classroom. The, mu the museum is expanding. Our museum curator, Rachel Dahanzik, has done a wonderful job with all of the things you've seen here today. Right. She's planned them and organizes them, you know, mm -hmm. she's very, very good at that. So, um, when did, here. when did, uh, when did Megan buy the, buy the A.J. Mirwald? When do you think, what decade was that? It's been more than that? 25 years ago because we had our 25th anniversary okay. a couple years ago. Like, okay. Yeah, in like, I think 2016 or 17. So yeah, it's been, um, it's a time ago. It's such a wonderful place. Uh, when I first came here uh, for a sale, um, actually I came here last year because I wanted to come and check out the museum because I'm a museum nerd, which is a great thing. You know, anything about history and backstory and information is just right up my alley. So um, I would think our, our watchers, if they haven't been here already, please come to this wonderful museum and Terry will give you a tour. But let me ask you what, it, so here, let me just grab a prop for a second. What is this, Terry? <laughs> this is an oyster shell. Oh my goodness. It's half of an oyster it's shell. It's half of an oyster shell. Because an oyster so shell is a bivalve. Like something like that. And bivalve is two. Two. I think I grabbed two of the same. I, did, I grabbed okay. two tops. <laughs> <laughs> but a bivalve is two, you know, bi for two, two mm -hmm. shells. And um, there are other bivalves besides oysters, of course, clams and mussels, and, you know, there's others. But right. an oyster is a bivalve. And this town. Was called Bivalve. This town was a separate town from Port Norris right. back in the day. And in 1971, um, when they came out with zip codes and everything, they closed our post office here mm -hmm. and sort of incorporated us mail-wise into the zip code for Port Norris. So we're kind of Port Norris. But when in 1957, when a lot of the oysters died, over 90% of the oysters died due to diseases, that's what kind of made the town start to die. Mm. But this used to be a very bustling town. So previous to that, lots of oysters. Lots of oysters. Lots. Millions, yes, millions. Millions. Millions, millions of, of bushels of oysters. Wow. Bushels, um, yes. Until 1957, a disease struck the oysters, MSX. And the guys would went out to dredge up their oysters. They dredged up all the oysters, dumped them on the deck, got down on their hands and knees to call them out. And here they were, most of them were dead. 90% mm -hmm. of them. 80 to 90% of the oysters died. And uh, overnight, so all the industry, not just the oyster industry, but then they couldn't pay their employees, their employees couldn't buy food, so they didn't need baskets, they didn't need burlap bags, they didn't need the support trades. That all so collapsed, the whole town unfortunately. Collapsed, yeah. Wow. It was a really hard time. And then, of course, the Haskins Lab, Rutgers Haskins Lab worked very hard, very hard, and by 1963, they really thought, now we have an uh, oyster resistant to this disease. We're all set. The oysters are getting healthy. They're coming back. It's great. Another disease hit, and that's oh, dermo. Wow. And dermo is not as quite as deadly, but it's not. The oysters are not becoming resistant to dermo. So, but um, we have lots of oysters. So it's still happening. They're, they're still, still happening. They're still and oyster they're men back. and oyster women and yes, processing plants back. and everything. Yes, they are coming back. And there's oyster rate 
just up the street here, the Vinyl right. Packing Company. Um, they're, we're getting oysters from them all the time. There's uh, Cape May Salt Oyster Company right oh, around that's the corner. Great. Harbor House is less than a mile from here. They are one of the last shucking houses left. Mm. They're still shucking oysters. Oh, good. And our Oyster Cracker Cafe sells <laughs> oysters from all of these places, mostly from Bivel Packing and the Harbor House, because Harbor House is where you buy them already shucked out in some lovely right. cans, oh, yeah. such as these. And now today, Look at these wonderful cans. We're using these uh, plastic buckets. So the lovely plastic buckets are what we're using the now. Sailor boy. But, but then you see now down uh -huh. here, all, all of the, the old different cans. Uh, different companies. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see some of them say Port Norris, Morris River, New Jersey, Port Norris, mm -hmm. Bivalve, Morris, New Jersey. Morris River was right across the river from here. Mm -hmm. If you stand out on our docks right. and look across, you'll see some piling sticking up and stuff. That was a whole town. Wow. And it was called Morris River. It was a whole town. They had schools and churches and everything. Uh, people lived there. People shopped oysters there. They had, similar to this, their mm. own type of, sort of like shipping sheds. Mm -hmm. These shipping sheds were built by the railroad company. And there were a lot of businesses there might have been a meat market or a hat maker or a ship, you know, make parts for ships or right. whatever business you wanted. You would rent the upstairs and downstairs. You could have whatever business here you wanted. Oh, that's amazing. It was like a strip mall. People, you know, would come yep. and shop up and down. I noticed the signage outside, yes. the old-fashioned signage. And that's all historical. We all have, we have photographic evidence. And that's how we chose which signs. Okay. Signs that were here in the time period we're trying to interpret, which is kind of like the 20s, mm -hmm. the early 30s, like that time period late 20s, early 30s. Hey friends, we're here by a shucking station at the Bayshore Center and Museum and Bivalve. Very exciting. Got lots of interesting displays about how the oyster industry boomed in this area. So the first story that we're gonna read for this time is called the rainbow fish. I know you know this story. It's a very popular story and it's very beautiful too. And I thought it was appropriate. And it's written by a gentleman named Marcus Fister. And he's written a lot of the series on rainbow fish, but this is the first one. So here we go. Are you ready? A long way out in the deep blue sea, there lived a fish, not just an ordinary fish, but the most beautiful fish in the entire ocean. His scales were every shade of blue and green and purple with sparkling silver scales among them. Beautiful fishy. The other fish were amazed at his beauty. They called him rainbow fish. Come on rainbow fish, they would call. Come and play with us. But the rainbow fish would just glide past proud and silent letting his scales shimmer. One day, a little blue fish followed after him. Rainbow fish, he called, wait for me. Please give me one of your shiny scales. They are so wonderful and you have so many. Maybe he could spare one for this little fish. But if everybody asked him for one, then he wouldn't have any more. You want me to give you one of my special scales? Who do you think you are? Said the rainbow fish. Get away from me. <laughs> Shocked, the little blue fish swam away. He was so upset he told all his friends what had happened. From then, from then on, no one would have anything to do with rainbow fish. They turned away when he swam by. I wonder if he's rethinking his reaction to that question. He could have been a little nicer, don't you think? What good were the dazzling, shimmering scales when no one was there to admire them? Now he was the loneliest fish in the entire ocean. But he looked good. One day he poured out his troubles to the starfish. I really am beautiful. Why doesn't anyone like me? I can't answer that for you, said the starfish. But if you go beyond the coral reef to the deep cave, you can find the wise octopus. Maybe she can help you. So he was talking to a starfish down there. The rainbow fish found the cave. 
It was very dark inside and he couldn't do anything. Then suddenly, two eyes caught him in their glare and the octopus emerged from the darkness. Isn't that cool? Look at that picture. I have been waiting for you, said the octopus with a deep voice. The waves told me your story. This is my advice. Give a glittering scale to each of the other fish. You will no longer be the most beautiful fish in the sea, but you will discover how to be happy. I think the wise octopus is telling him that it's good to share. What do you think? I can't, the rainbow fish started to say, but the octopus had already disappeared. She went back into her cave in a dark cloud of ink. Give away my scales. My beautiful shiny scales? Never! How could I ever be happy without them? Suddenly he felt the light touch of a fin. The little blue fish was back. A sweet little blue fish. Rainbow fish, please don't be angry. I just want one little scale. The rainbow fish wavered. Only one very, very small shimmery scale, he thought. Well, maybe I wouldn't miss just one. See the shimmery scales? Ooh. Carefully, the rainbow fish pulled out the smallest scale and gave it to the little fish. <gasps> Thank you. Thank you very much, the little blue fish bubbled playfully as he tucked the shiny scale in among his blue ones. A rather peculiar feeling came over the rainbow fish. For a long time, he watched the little blue fish swim back and forth with his new scale glittering in the water. What kind of peculiar feeling do you think he had? The little blue fish whizzed through the ocean with his scale flashing and didn't take long before the rainbow fish was surrounded by other fish. Everyone wanted a glittering scale. The rainbow fish shared his scales left and right, and the more he gave away, the more delighted he became. When the water around him was filled with glimmering scales, at last he felt at home among the other fish. Do you see all the other fish having a little glimmery scale? Can you see that? He shared his special scales with everybody so they can all feel special too. And he could feel a part of the group. Finally, the rainbow fish had only one shiny scale left. His most prized possessions had been given away. Yet he was very happy. Come on, rainbow fish, they called. Come and play with us. Here I come, said the rainbow fish, as happy as a splash. He swam off to join his friends. Oh, that's so sweet. There he is with his one little shiny scale. Yay. Whoop, whoop. All right. So we are going to read this lovely book called Hopper and Wilson. What does Hopper look like to you? Hopper looks like an elephant to me. And Wilson, yes, you're right, looks like a little mouse. And these two are friends. And look at their boat. They made a boat out of a piece of newspaper. I think they're going to go on a journey. This book is by Maria Van Leishout. And I think she illustrated it as well. And she has dedicated this to my father and brother who travel to the end of the world to find what matters most. I wonder what they found. Maybe we'll find out. Hopper and Wilson looked out over the big blue sea and they wondered. Hmm. What, Hopper asked his little friend Wilson, do you think it's like at the end of the world? I'm not sure, Hopper, Wilson answered but I bet there's lots of lemonade. <laughs> what? I love lemonade. And a staircase to the moon, Hopper said, so I could touch it. 
if they have a cactus. Well, there's only one way to find out, Hopper said. They packed their balloon with the red string, launched their boat, and said goodbye to their cactus. You can't come along, Wilson peeped. You're too small. So the cactus stayed behind. And off they sailed. They waved until their cactus had disappeared behind the edge of the sea. Bye, cactus. They bobbed on the waves and dreamed about what they would find at the end of the world. Oh, look, it's night. When a star dashed across the sky, the two friends closed their eyes and made a wish. Hopper wished to touch the moon, and Wilson hoped to find an endless supply of lemonade. <laughs> I think that's a good wish. They woke up when fat drops of rain hit their faces. Oh no! I hope our journey won't be too choppy, Hopper said. I wish we'd brought a blanket, Wilson said, shivering. Ooh. It can get cold out there in the sea, especially during a storm. Hold on. Page turning troubles, please stand by. The breeze turned into gusts. Gusts became howling winds that flung the boat from wave to wave. Hold on, Hopper! Even the birdie's having trouble flying through that. But the sea was loud and angry, and it swallowed up Wilson's scream. Hopper couldn't hear a thing except the roar of the crashing waves. How are they managing to stay in that little boat? I don't know. When the sea settled down and the wind grew silent, Hopper wasn't in the boat anymore. Wilson was afraid. He looked for Hopper among the sea turtles. I lost my friend Hopper. Have you seen him by any chance? They had not. But they could probably help out by looking for him. Sea turtles are amazing. Or on the icebergs, couldn't find him either. He's a big guy. Blue, funny ears. They hadn't seen him either. Oh, where is he? Where is Hopper? Wilson even asked a giant fish. Look at that big giant fish right here. It's a big whale. Hopper is not good at being alone, you see. But the fish just blinked and swam away. When Wilson looked up, he saw a bird carrying their balloon's red string. <gasps> Do you know where Hopper is? The birds circled above the boat and then flew into the fog. So Wilson sailed into that fog too. Hopper! Hopper! Wilson, is that you? Called a voice. I think he's on top of his balloon. Wilson! Hopper! Hopper and Wilson held each other for a long time. I missed you, Wilson. I missed you too, Hopper. They found each other. Then that's when something peeked over the edge of the sea and the two friends cheered and laughed and danced. Yay, yay! We arrived at the end of the world. I bet I can reach the moon from there, Hopper said. Are those lemons? Wilson asked. <laughs> and there's our cactus. We're home, Wilson peeped. Aren't we lucky that our home is at the end of the world, Wilson? Wilson closed his eyes. And at the beginning, too, he peeped. Hopper and Wilson. You can come into the library and check it out for yourself if you want. Take it home. Oh, yeah. And our last book is another Rainbow Fish book. 
I know you like that first one so much, we're gonna try another one. This one is Rainbow Fish and the Big Blue Whale. Wow, this is great. Look at that picture. Look how tiny Rainbow Fish is. And look how big that blue whale is. When I was a little girl, my folks used to take me to the American Museum of Natural History in Manhattan. Some of you might know it as New York City. And there was a replica of a blue whale suspended from the ceiling. The, and the length of it, it was so big. I couldn't believe how big the whales actually were. I mean, to see it like that in a museum, imagine seeing it in the ocean. So if you get a chance, take a field trip, go up to New York and go to the American Museum of Natural History. You could see dinosaur bones and dinosaurs and all kinds of creatures, including that giant blue whale. And let me know if you go and how you liked it. So here's another Marcus Pfister rainbow fish and the big blue whale book for you today. A long way out in the deep blue sea, rainbow fish and his friends swam happily through the reef. Look, everybody has that scale that he gave them, right? Because he was so generous with his special scales. Each of them had a glittering silver scale, except for one little striped fish but he belonged to the group anyway. You don't have to have a scale to get into this club. That's good. When the fish were hungry, they ate tiny krill. There seemed to be an endless supplies of these delicious little shrimp. Rainbow fish only needed to glide gently through the water with his mouth open to catch as many as he wanted. It was a wonderful life. Imagine if that's how we got our lunch. We just open our mouth in the water and just glide gently through until we were full. One day, a gentle old whale swam by the reef and decided to stay. He liked the spot since he too ate the krill that were so plentiful there. And he enjoyed being around the glittering fish. Often he drifted along watching them for hours, admiring their beautiful silvery scales. Imagine having a big giant blue whale as a friend. Oh yeah. Before long, the fish with the jagged fins noticed the whale watching them. Why is he looking at us like that? He asked the others. He was in a particularly bad mood that day. See how he's staring at us? He went on irritably. Who knows what he's thinking? You know what he was acting? He was acting crabby. <laughs> And all, after all, the fish grew more and more suspicious of the whale. What? Look at that giant mouth, said one. Soon the krill will be all gone. Rainbow fish began to worry. Until now, the fish had always been able to eat their fill. What if the whale did eat up all the krill? And why did he keep staring at them? Was he planning to eat them too? I think these little fish were getting paranoid. <laughs> they should have just talked to the whale. One day, the whale swam quite near the school of glittering fish. Panicked, the fish with the jagged fins sounded the alarm. Look out, the whale is after us. When the whale heard that, he was hurt at first, but soon he grew very angry. I'll show them, he thought. I'll teach them a lesson. That's what happens when people don't talk to each other. So the great blue whale shot into the middle of the school and lashed out with his gigantic tail, sweeping the sparkling fish in all directions. Look at them all. He made big waves with his tail under the water. Oops, dropping the book. The terrified fish fled, racing toward a crack in the reef for safety. But the whale didn't leave them alone. He followed Rainbow Fish and his friends all the way back to their cave. Look at that pretty picture, even though it's a little scary for the fish. Got sea urchins and coral and grass and seaweed. And the ocean at this depth looks purple, doesn't it? I think it's a very pretty picture. The blue whale swam back and forth, casting sinister glances at the little fish. They were trapped. 
I told you that whale was dangerous, whispered the fish with the jagged fins. We have to watch out for him. After a while, the whale calmed down. He made one last pass, and then he dis disappeared behind the reef. Nervous, but driven by hunger, the fish cautiously left their cave and swam off in search of food. But the battle with the whale had left its mark. All the krill had been driven off. This is silly, declared Rainbow Fish. Before, we played happily in the sea. Now we hide in terror in our cave? Before, there was always enough food for everyone. Now we have nothing. We must make peace with the whale. The other fish were all too afraid to approach the whale. It was up to Rainbow Fish. The whale stared at Wayne, Wayne, Rainbow. Hello. <laughs> the whale stared at Rainbow Fish suspiciously. I did it. Please, let's talk, said Rainbow Fish. This fight was all a big mistake. It drove off the krill, and now we're all hungry. The two talked for a long time. The whale told Rainbow Fish how hurt and angry their hostile words had made him. I never meant to harm you, said the whale. Just scare you a little. Rainbow Fish was ashamed. I'm sorry, he said, but when we saw you watching us all the time, we were afraid you might eat us. The whale looked surprised. I watched you only because your shining scales are so pretty, he said. They both laughed. <laughs> <laughs> Come now, said the whale. Let's find new hunting grounds. Wow, look at that picture. How beautiful. So Rainbow Fish and his friends, protected by their new friend, the big blue whale, swam off together in search of a home rich with krill. And before long, none of them could remember what the terrible fight had been about. Even the spiky fish. The end. Yay, Rainbow Fish, woo! They resolved their problems and everyone lived happily ever after. That's right. Hey, so stay tuned for more stories or a craft and thank you so much for hanging out with me, Miss Adaria here at the Bay Shore Center at Bivalve. Wow. Hey everybody, welcome back. Woo! We are doing more and along our pirate theme. We're gonna be making a first mate, er, and his bird friend. Tweet, tweet! And how are we gonna do that? Well, what I did already was I wrapped this lovely piece of toilet paper roll with some green paper, and I cut the side down and for the bird, I wrapped this with pink paper, and then I used the scraps to make little triangles, which we're gonna use as the beak. So we'll start with the bird, and we'll finish up with the first mate. So for the birdie, I'm going to put some glue stick on the folded portion of this, and we're going to stick this right on top of the other one, and since they're not going to be stuck together on the bottom, they're going to come apart and it's going to look like a beak. Does that look like a beak? Uh, yes. I approve. As someone with a beak. All right, thanks very much. I really appreciate that. So there's your beak. And for some eyes, I am going to cut out some eyeballs and we can put a different color. We could put say yellow for the smaller part of the eye because look at this bird's eye. You see that? So maybe we'll do yellow for the big part and black for the small part. So we just reversed our decision. So yellow for the big part. And we'll do a nice big yellow eye 
and then we'll do smaller for the pupil. Really hope you enjoyed your time at, uh, at Bayshore. Isn't it a wonderful place? Museum is so informative. And that nice lady named Terry that we got to talk to, she knows so much about that place and all about the history of the oyster industry at Bivalve and across the river at towns that don't exist anymore. There's one eyeball and here comes, you know, you know, I like to say the word eyeball number two. I think it's funny. Eyeball. Say that five times and then you won't know what you're talking about. Eyeball, 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 eyeball. <laughs> it's just one of those words. And here we're going to cut out his little pupils. I know I could use one of those funny little eyes that we have, those little plastic eyes, but I don't know. I'm just not into plastic, kids. I just don't want to put any more plastic out there on the planet. There's certainly enough for every one of us. So anything that I can make out of biodegradable material for your crafting, makes me very happy and I hope you're okay with that too because I'm thinking about your future and the future of our fabulous planet. So there's your little pupils. They're very tiny so you can pick them up with a little glue stick. Give it a little glue stick and get it right in there. Don't they look like funny little eyes? I think this birdie is going to be here, I'll make this eye a little, a little wonky. <laughs> Our wonky bird. Then put some glue stick on the bottom. And get those eyes on there. I'm going to say one on either side of his beak. Because birds' eyes are on the sides of their head as opposed to right in front. And do you know why? Why? I've often wondered myself. It's so they can see predators on either side of them instead of just looking forward like our eyes are closer together and predators' eyes are closer together. Their eyes are on the side of their head so they can have a wider range of vision so they don't get eaten for lunch. <gasps> Oh, thank goodness. Thank you for explaining that, for bird explaining that to us, Miss Adoria. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so for the rest of our birdie, we're just going to do some colorful stuff here. And I was thinking maybe to mimic our parrot friend here, or maybe it's a macaw. I'm sorry, no offense. Uh, we're going to do some wings. So I'm just going to free cut some wings here. Okay, and we'll just kind of cut another one that sort of looks like the shape. Can you see that? I hope I didn't go out of the frame for that one. Okay. They don't have to be perfect. Everything is wonderful. And you could put your wings on your side of your bird like that. Or if you want to come in with another color, because these birds are very colorful. You can do a half a wing and we can glue that. So we could just do it like that. And we can glue it to that part. No, I don't like the way that looks. So here, let's do a let's do a whole wing out of a different color and then we'll just cut it in half. How does that sound? Okay. Whatever you say. It's your bird. You can make it however you want to make it. You can put 17 colors on this bird's wing if you want to. Or you could just do it in one color. But I'm just going by what the bird actually looks like and trying to make a good representation of it. So let's cut this guy right in half.
We could do something like, like that. Let's cut this one down just a little bit more because this wing was a little narrower. Okay, how do you like that? I think it's amazing. Let's put a little glue stick on here. Get that going. Get a little glue stick on this guy. Okay, I think I know, I see what's happening here and that's good because it's going to be visually interesting. One of his wings is going to be green and blue. The other one's going to be blue and green. Yes! Yes! So right here, right about there, right on the side, you could put it out if you want to so that when you put it down, it's not bending. You could just put a little glue stick on here and here and get that bird going you like that wing I think it's great do you like a pink bird body oh yeah just hold it down for a second until it sticks you might have to put just a little bit more glue stick I'm going to put a little bit more glue stick on the top of this one so it stays. I didn't really put very much, so. Okay. Okay. So that's our birdie so far. And how do you feel about one more color on the front? I mean, we could probably do this with feathers, but I don't know. I like construction paper. We do have some feathers. We might put feather on the top of his head. Here, let's get that coming up to a little bit more of a point. And this could be his, his breast color. So you could do glue stick on this whole thing so it sticks to the toilet paper roll. Just hold that on there because it has to go around in a little bit of a circle, a half a circle. What a kooky looking bird. Thank you, I like it a lot. And what about feet? You wanna do some feet? You could do some, here, let me draw the feet. It might be a little bit harder. And I'm gonna draw them a little bit longer because you know why? We're gonna stick, them, stick his feet up into the toilet paper roll like little tabs. Oh, that's okay. It was just one little part of his toe. Ow! Here's one foot. This foot's a little bigger. Okay, there's our little birdie feet. If you turn them over, you could put a little glue stick on the end. And you could put them under this here, right? And you can fold them like that, and then it'll flap down. And hopefully it'll stay. It's not really staying, so you might want to use regular glue for this. But since we're a tiny bit short on time for this segment, we're just going to use the glue stick, and you can use your imagination. So there's our booty. Isn't he cute? It's not cute. All right, so now we're going to make his friend the first mate. Arr. And his friend the first mate 
is going to be with this body. And what we're going to do is we're going to give him some black pants. First mate, how's your black pants going? Oh, pretty good. Let's even them up just a little bit. We might use that little black piece. I'm not sure. And let's see where the seam is so we don't have to shuffle him around too much. It's okay if it's a little bit short. So we're gonna do, might do glue on both sides like this since we're not wrapping it around itself. We're just wrapping it onto the toilet paper roll. Come as close to that seam as you can. Roll it up tight. Tightly, excuse me. I am the, they call me the adverb lady because I like to add my LYs. The adverb is a dying word, did you know that? Because nobody uses their LYs anymore. So what I just said, wrap it up tight. It's supposed to be wrap it up tightly. So there you go. That's what being a librarian is all about. <laughs> and we're gonna use a nice colorful pink sash for this dude because he's looking pretty boring there with just black and green. So we're gonna come in and give him a nice pop of color. Here is your pop of color, first mate. I'm sure he's gonna appreciate it. Cause he got this beautiful sash when he was on a pirate voyage to, where do you think? How about India? Yes, that's right. To the magical land of India. So we're going to put some glue stick on this side of his sash. Come on now, let's go, what's going on here? It's very hard to uh, glue napkin because it's so delicate. And we'll put a little more glue stick on this side so it really stays on there. And we're going to wrap this first matey up arr, in a very colorful sash. Arr. What do you think about that? Oh, that looks fantastic. And... Uh, we're gonna give him a hat, a little pirate hat, because all pirates should have pirate hats. Don't you think? Yes, I think. So they usually kind of come off the end a little bit. They have a little bit of a rounded thing and another coming off of the end. And then, yeah, okay. And then we're going to make a little skull and crossbones. And we're going to draw his face right on the green. Arrgh! Time waits for no pirate. Arrgh! 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 Pirate just knows when the sun goes down and when the sun comes up. And when the tide is out. And when the tide is in, arr. and when their bellies are hungry and when they're not. And uh, where's that? Okay, here we go. Now, to draw a little skull and crossbones, really, it's just, you know, like a little skull. And crossbones, usually it's the femur, the biggest bone in the leg. You can draw one just like that over here. Something like that. What do you think about that? Arr, it's very exciting, matey. And we could put that right on his... Right on his hat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to color it in a little, outline it a little bit in gray just so it has some definition.
And what skull isn't smiling, right? Are you matey? We can glue that right on there. Yes. Arr. Hey, have you guys figured out what you're going to be for Halloween yet? It's coming up. And look, see, I cut the toilet paper roll on either side so you could slip his hat right in there. Arr. I like my hat. But what about my face? I can't see anything. I don't have an eye. Arr. So we're going to do one of his eyes. There's an eye. Arr. And a little nose and a little roguish smile. And the other one, we're going to do an eye patch. Because apparently not only do pirates lose a lot of limbs, people come and poke them in their eyes all the time. So they, <laughs> so they lose... A lot of one eye. I don't know why this is. It's just what I know. Arr. So there is your pirate. He unfortunately does not have any arms or legs or a sword because that must have happened to him also. So you've got your pirate, your first mate pirate, and your birdie who's losing a foot, but that's okay. And they're friends forever. What do you think about that? Aren't they cute? Very stylish. And don't forget our captain. Remember we made him? Arr. Look, he suddenly acquired a feather. He's the most stylish captain. This is the first mate, and here is their friend, the parrot, from Exotic Ports of Call. Thank you so much. Please stay tuned for more story times. You have a wonderful day, and thank you for crafting with Miss Adaria.